Good evening, everybody. Up and I'll say hello. Hello. <laughs> Ectoplasm, yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, what is that? Mediumship. Yeah. So that's our chapter. Let's go live. Yes, so there we are. Okay, so let's start off with a short prayer as others will continue to join us. Close your eyes, connect down to your palate. Let's align ourselves to what we want to do now. Feel yourself in the presence of all these great teachers, great beings, the beings of knowledge, light, and power who will help us all through the session to have a greater, deeper, clearer understanding. Let's invoke to the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother. We humbly invoke for your great, great blessings to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chokotsi Lord Maha Guruji Nele, to the Lord Christ, to all the great beings of knowledge, wisdom, and light, to the great teachers and masters of theosophy, to the angels and beings of communication, our respective Wi-Fi's and internet connections, to our soul and divine self, we humbly ask for your great, great blessings, for your light, for your love, for your mercy, for your guidance and knowledge, all through the session, help us to gain greater and deeper knowledge of these priceless teachings imparted to us. May we be able to assimilate this knowledge, make it part of all our learnings and use it to become better divine instruments in your service. I offer myself as a humble instrument to do your work. Let thy will be done, not the urges of our own nature. With thanks and in full faith, so be it. We're super receptive, super conductive to all the energies, to all the blessings, to all the knowledge and wisdom. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You may slowly open your eyes. Atma Namaste, everybody. Welcome to chapter 24. Yes. I think there was more response to, uh, to the little poster we created on Facebook and we placed. But anyway, uh, besides that, all of you are here. So we will begin. I'm just going to mute everyone so it becomes easier. Yeah. All right. Can you imagine we're almost coming to the end of the book? Ah, oh, finally. <laughs> this is four months almost. Two, three and a half months. Well. Oh, book. I think because two of us are doing it, it took maybe double the time. Probably. Yeah. That could be a possibility. But then you got two study sessions for the price of none. <laughs> So. <laughs> so for the time of one <laughs> for the right. time of one okay well, so the one time hour. Is just the one hour <laughs> so we're moving to chapter 24 ectoplasm right uh, so let's start off with what this means in greek ecto means outside and also plasma and the mold and so it says that which is molded outside of the human body right is a name given to the matter mainly if not wholly etheric, so it's not necessarily only etheric, which exudes from a medium, that is a person. Remember we were talking about mediums earlier. So it comes out of the medium and is employed, employed for seances. Yes, the, the phenomenon that we were talking about earlier. And we also go later into table lifting, uh, levitation and also rapping. Remember the sound that comes. So most of what we're going to be talking about today is basically all the experiments that uh, W.J. Crawford has done, right? And they say, if you want more details, you need to get these books. So if you're lucky, you might find these books. So the three books that they mention here are basically the reality of psychic phenomena, the experiments in the psychical uh, science and the psychic structures, right? And so this is basically all the work that he's done. Um, I'm sure it wasn't easy in those days. I mean, it's not easy even to, in today's day and age uh, to gather all this information, right? 
uh, go against probably authorities and uh, the various religions, because I'm sure the Catholic Church and the Christian Church was very strong, uh, to go uh, past all their orthodox uh, thoughts and actually bring this research together and then accept, get ac accepted by the scientific community is not very easy. So, uh, so basically what he did is the research is basically uh, surround, I mean, basically um, around three aspects, which is the table lifting, yes, or levitation that he calls and wrapping, right? The sound that comes when it, it touches the wall or the floor or a bell. And so uh, keeping this in mind during all experiments, uh, they say that the medium, the person who's involved in this process was fully conscious. Yeah, none of them were sub, uh, un, subconscious or uh, even unconscious at any point. And so he says, uh, he started to look at all this scientifically, because if you just see these tables suddenly, you know, levitating and up there, you wonder what is happening. Is there a ghost in the room? What's going on, right? And there is. So, <laughs> so, there is a supposed ghost. to be. Okay, so there's a ghost in the room. And so he says he started to try and uh, basically use the whole process of observation and deduction. And so based on what should normally occur, he started to uh, deduce from that. And he was able to actually give us some information. And also he says later on, he was able to use vision, direct vision and photography uh, to further capture what he's talking about in these experiments. So to start off with, he says, um, he started off with purely mechanics, right? When it comes to structures, when it comes to tables, he said, uh, by means of force registering appliances, both mechanical, he looked at electrical, he succeeded in, in discovering by the process of deduction and observation, uh, the modus operandi for the psychic structures employed. And uh, he goes on to say that he talks about this ectoplasm now, right? So he says, it was found that ectoplasm exudes, that means comes out of the person, the medium, uh, was prepared and shaped by the operator or the person who's sending it, uh, who controls the production of the phenomenon. So the amount of ectoplasm that will come, will be released from the medium or the people seated there, will depend on the will, right? Remember we spoke about will, yes, we have him here. <laughs> That's Noel's little toy from <laughs> Ghostbuster. There was a big, huge uh, air balloon that walks through. I think the streets. It's a machine of New York. man. Yeah, but he walks through the. Yeah, it's a machine of... man. It's marshmallow bag. Marshmallow man. Marshmallow. Yeah, yeah marshmallow. But this no, is the one from the old eighties Ghostbusters. Okay. It's tasty, but not much. Okay, not mentioned. Yes. And uh, so how does this exude or come out of the person? They basically talk about these rods that come out, right? And we referred to rods earlier as the cords that you and I call in pranic healing. So there are these cords that come out. Uh, they call it rods, they call it bars. Um, and so we'll move on to try and understand this. So you have one end that is connected to the medium and the other end, right? So we're going to talk about what's, what's there in this rod. And so it says one is connected to the medium and the other uh, onto the object. For example, here they give you the legs of the table or any object. The psychic force being then applied through the cord, the rods, uh, the table, etc., move in various ways. So they could move with that rod connecting to the, to the legs of the table. They could move the table upwards, bring it down, maybe move it left, maybe right, yes? So there could be movement based on this connection onto the physical objects that are around, meant for uh, whatever process they're going through, right? And the raps uh, and many other noises, yes, are produced uh, by the, the cords that strike the floor or the table or the bell, yes, or the walls probably. So um, it's interesting. So let's just try and understand a little bit more about the rods as we go now. By far the greater proportion, sorry, greater portion of the ectoplasm is usually obtained mostly from the medium. Yes, and a small portion is also taken from the other people who are seated on that table. So if you're talking about the table being moved, you have say six people 
Uh, number one is the medium. So he or she will actually provide the maximum amount of ectoplasm, right? And the other five, this, the sitters as they're called, they will produce uh, a smaller amount of ectoplasm for this entire process to happen. So the elevation of the stable that goes up in some time. The ectoplasm can sometimes, even though quite invisible to ordinary light, when it is seen, sorry, when it is felt, uh, they, they give some interesting uh, sensations. Now, I'm, I've not really tried this out, but here it goes. They say it's clammy, uh, right? It's cold, it's uh, reptilian, you know, so it's, it's like touching a snake or a crocodile, uh, almost oily, yes. Uh, basically, what they're saying is, it, the air particles mix with this. So touching and then, snakes and crocodiles is what we do every day, right? So we, we, it's not very pleasant. So basically the matter that you feel is not very pleasant. Now this, Oil. considering maybe the energy that is going through the cord is not very pleasant. And so they, they mentioned that. Um, I'll talk about one bit and then I'll give it to you. Yeah, whatever you yeah. want. So now the rod, uh, this the psychic rod or the cord that they're talking about has a certain diameter and so they say it's from half an inch and can increase to as big as seven to eight inches right so depending on what you want to work right now say for example you want to just lift this up this doesn't need that much ectoplasm as maybe this whole table needs right so if i want to move a whole table obviously i'll need more and so the pipeline through which i send my my ectoplasm out right, I exude this through the, the, through the cord, will obviously be much more. So proportionately, there would be a difference in, in the size of the rod and also the person sending it out. Okay, uh, so talking about the size. So the free end of the rod uh, seems able to assume various shapes, yes, degrees of hardness as well. Now, though we were talking about being oily and cold or reptilian, you'll notice later on they talk about it being as soft as baby skin and can become as hard as iron rods. So the quality of this, this uh, cord, which I never uh, felt the reason to ever feel, uh, is what they're describing here. And so to move on, so they say that this rod, uh, the end, right? The, the end may be flat or convex, circular or oval, right? So more or less, it, it looks like a tube. So that's why all these shapes, they, it's either flat, it's convex, it's, uh, it's oval or it's circular. Now it can be as, as soft as baby flesh or as hard as iron. Okay, here it comes. And the body of the uh, cord feels solid a few inches from the free end, but then it becomes intangible. You can't even uh, feel it as much. Uh, though it resists pulls, pushes, there is also shear and there's also uh, movement. There's, there's a force movement. So uh, that also does happen. Now, this intangible portion, right? That's the one that they spoke about earlier. It starts to feel, uh, it flows, a flow of cold, then pores like particles can be felt. The flow being outward from the medium. Yes, so basically we're just talking about this cord that starts from the medium and goes towards the object, right? And so in the process, it can be hard, soft, cold, reptilian, whatever. I think it depends on the medium and it depends on the object that it's going to go and touch, right? And uh, there appears to be no reason to believe that in some cases, though not in uh, levitation, there is a complete circulation of this etheric matter that goes out of the medium and then comes back to the medium and attaches at the different part of his or her body. The condition of the end of the rod as uh, regards size and hardness uh, can be varied in on demand. The larger rods are usually fairly soft at the end. The smaller rods only become dense and hard. Yes. So there are short and long rods. There are thick rods. There are you know, tiny little rods, there are thick ones, there are long and short ones. The quality in the rods are all different. Now, this is just information, yeah? You don't have to worry because I don't think any of us, especially if you're healers, we're going to sit and say, okay, fine, let me check the quality of the cord near me and then go towards a patient check. We're not going to really do that. But this is just extra information here, yeah? Um, we'll go to some more information about the cord in a bit. I'll give it to you. 
Um, okay, so uh, what they're saying, so I'll go start from the beginning uh, and we look at another point, point of view. Ujwala, I like the Pillsbury in Edo boy. <laughs> No, that's the, anyway. Yeah, that's no all look the with same, the, right? With a <clears throat> Ghostbuster car as well. We'll show you that a little later. Um, so they're talking about ectoplasm. I thought it's like biology, <laughs> you know, the part of the cytoplasm, the outer part. But actually it does look like that sometimes. Maybe that's why it, uh, it gave the name ectoplasm. Um, now, if you look at it, if you see it, it says mainly if not wholly etheric. So what is it made of, ectoplasm? So it says it's mainly, if not wholly etheric matter. Okay, now why does the question is, why does it need to be etheric matter? Because most of the time the entities or elementals sometimes, uh, or the, you know, the people who are dead, they're mostly um, astral beings and they need etheric matter and also some physical matter to transition or occupy that space. So that is why uh, what's important to note here is that they need, the purpose is to, to have a, um, a, you know, a, a vessel to occupy, all right, right now. Um, before we go into all this uh, levitation and uh, all this stuff that Sumi was also talking about, we need to understand, uh, you know, these are just the methods. Now the question is methods for what? Methods for the early chapter of mediumship. Now, what are the manifestations of um, what are the manifestations of how uh, a seance is done based on Bishop Ledbetter's book, uh, uh, what is it? Spiritualism and Theosophy, or whatever? Um, he talks about there are three basically types of uh, man materialization because all of this is something that's dematerialized, trying to materialize. Okay, so it's a materialization process. <clears throat> and there are three types. The first type is something that is not invisible, but, uh, but tangible. So you can feel it, right? But you cannot see it, right? Now, if you have something that you can feel, but you cannot see, in order to communicate, they have to do tapping. So if you see the movie Kardec on Netflix, the way the beings communicate, although you cannot see, is by communicating by tap. So one tap means something, two taps mean something, three taps mean something, and then that's how they communicate, or rapping, or tapping, or whatever. Is there something like rapping? Yeah. No. Oh, yeah, okay. Rapping it's not the, the 20th century no, rapping. Not either. our rapping. Okay, so... You're man. <laughs> so, um, um, actually, that's rock, right? This is Anyway, so whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, I don't know. So basically that is number one. Number two, you have something that's visible, uh, but is intangible. So you can see a whisper or a vapor kind of uh, form, but you cannot touch it. In fact, the, 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 the condition is so unstable, if you touch it, it might dematerialize or might go away. Okay. Then you have another type of materialization, the third one of the ectoplasm, which is, uh, which is visible, and tangible, so you can see it and you can touch it, okay? Now, all these chords and everything like that after this has to do with one of these three, all right? Uh, and the second paragraph, he talks about, uh, they want to look into, okay, basically this is talking about these books. And the third, now, during all experiments, the medium was fully conscious, so these, Experiments are only uh, for mediums who are conscious. And if you look into seances, which I tried to do uh, some time ago, uh, there are a lot of types of mediumships. It is unbelievable the number of types of mediumships there are. There are classifications like conscious and non conscious is just one of them. Then there's with, with, uh, with clothing, there's something with, what else was there? There are so many types, I don't know. Six, seven, eight types, six, seven, eight types of examples. Um, but I didn't, I wasn't so interested in those. Um, now, we will look at uh, one example of someone who is unconscious or subconsciously transmitting, but uh, uh, mediumship, mediumship. Yeah, we'll we look at that later. Now, when this Mr. Crawford approached the problems of table lifting, he looks at he looked at it as a mechanical issue and because for, uh, an electrical issue from his point of view. 
if you wanted to, that's why he calls it psychic structures, probably structural engineering. Because if you want to lift something physical, there must be some background or some basis behind it. And he wants to know what is the reason and the functioning behind all of it, right? So that was his, probably his, his, um, his idea behind going to all of this. And briefly, it was found that ectoplasm exudes from the medium. It was prepared and shaped by operators, da, 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 rods. Um, now, these rods, okay, one end is attached to the medium, all right? Now, where is it attached to the medium has not been mentioned. Now, that is a very important part for us to explain this more properly, which has not been mentioned yet, okay? Yeah, yeah. it comes a little later. Oh, it does? I don't know. Um, I don't remember. <laughs> I just read it. So, um, so, it's not mentioned yet. And the other by suction. Now, you have to understand, if they will mention the word suction, when you have a cord, you have someone who is the receiver and someone who is the giver, unless it's a relationship cord where it's two way. But most of the time, the cord is uh, one way. So a person has a lot of uh, energy and is very active and dynamic. Another person is physically tired or maybe a little depressed. They would cord your back solar plexus and the energy is being sucked. There's a suction effect from the person who's courting you, your solar plexus, to them, all right? So the suction is moving from you to them, all right? It is withdrawing. So that's why it's by suction to table legs, other objects, psychic force, being then applied through the rods. Now, what kind of psychic force, again, has not been mentioned. They've just mentioned psychic force, all right? You could also call it energy. And, um, and it's applied through the rods. So to make it easy, you just say psychic or energy is is passed through the rods or through the cords and uh, the tables and chairs are moved in various ways without purely any physical contact with any person present, all right? The wraps and many blah, 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 striking. Okay, so that is also okay. Now, I was actually looking in one of the books, they said that ectoplasm, one of the doctors saying has, uh, I don't know how they ma managed to do it, but it also uses the tissue and the, and, uh, of, the, of the medium. And that would make it more physical, but that really drains the uh, medium. Okay, so we'd have to look at that later. By far, the greater portion of is usually obtained from the medium. This is supplemented, so that's the source. We have gone through this in the medium uh, chapter already. Um, the ectoplasm can sometimes, even though it's quite invisible to ordinary sight, be felt. That's what we spoke about, the first part. Uh, invisible but tangible. Okay, now I don't know how it feels. I've never felt it, but this is how it's supposed to feel. Uh, the psychic rods issue, issuing from the medium may vary in diameter from half inch to seven inches to eight inches. Da, 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 da. Uh, yeah, so like Sumi says, it, it, it depends. It depends on several factors. It depends on who the person cording is. It depends what type of energy is passed through. It depends how much energy is passed through. And it depends what is the purpose of the whole thing, right? And usually it's just not one rod. If you want to uh, be able to understand it, so if you have a table, there'll be several rods or cords going into different parts and then it's used like a cantilever to pull it up, okay? Um, the end may be flax, so da, 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 the internal end of this, the flow of coal like spot will be felt. Uh, there appears reason to believe that in some cases, though not in levitation, there's complete circulation of ethic matter from out from the medium and back to again to a different part of body. The condition at the end of the rod is regards the size. Da, 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 da. So if you read uh, uh, one of Bishop Ledbetter's book, he was a little bit, uh, initially, a little bit skeptic. And this is a story he was talking about, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> he was talking about uh, how he, um, he was at a seance. And uh, what happened was uh, this, this person, was uh, because the seance is in a dark room so you know if you're being touched you dark don't know issue. yeah in his explanation it was quite dark so mm -hmm. not really visible visible but um you know he, someone was being touched and they're like oh i can feel i can feel so he was on the opposite side and he was listening and then um the other person was touched so he was a little skeptical like maybe someone is touching in the dark room you know somewhere else and then um he just blurted out all of a sudden 
I, I forgot the exact words, but something uh, something on the on the lines like, uh, would the uh, ghost be kind enough to have to give me a touch or something like that? Immediately, he felt his hand being grabbed like that, and then it was pulled so hard that he stood up. Right, he stood up, and not only did he stand up, he was pulled even higher, so he had to jump on his chair. Okay, and then he was pulled even higher and higher and higher till he was reaching the ceiling. <laughs> and uh, apparently, the ceiling was quite high, <laughs> right? And then he could feel through the ceiling a hand grabbing him. <laughs> Sorry if you have nightmares today, but it's uh, it's not a Ghostbusters. <laughs> anyway, a, a hand grabbing him. And then he uh, would feel it being gently being pulled down, you know, stretched down, and then he would be. Uh, he would land on the chair and he sat down. And then when he told some skeptics about it, the next day they said, look, it could be there was a trap door in the, in the ceiling. So he says, no, because it was less a white plastered ceiling. And he examined the ceiling after the seance was over and everything. He's like, although the ceiling was so high, I could have, it was, there was no sign of any crack uh, on the ceiling. And then they said, maybe they had planned it. So he says, how would they know that I was going to blurt that out? Even I didn't know I was going to blurt that out. You know, so that was another thing. <laughs> another time he saw a table being lifted and he was immediately trying to check below the table with his feet and he couldn't find anything. So these kind of things are really interesting. i uh, never seen them in my life. And uh, it's a good thing I read this chapter before if I ever see that because if you see these things without reading about ectoplasm, it's not going to be a fun uh, experience. experience for you. All right, so... Um, and it's probable that the rods consist of a bundle of fine threads. The psychic force passes. Da, 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 da. Okay. So let's just look at the presentation. Yes, we have made a presentation finally after four chapters. Just a very small one. Um, so, so this is what uh, in spiritualism and theosophy, if you're really interested, it's a very light read. Um, just stories about all these things without really going anywhere. But, you know, just stories if you're bored. Um, and these are the three types, the first that I explained. All right. And um, this is when um, you are not conscious. So this is the process of what Master Cho would call transmission, where he would ask his uh, thesis advisor, Lord Mahaguruji Meiling, or his senior disciple, Chuanjik Meiling, specific question and specific answers were given to them through Mang Mike and Mang, Mang Nene. Uh, the physical instruments in many cases could not remember the content of the specific questions or the specific answers. Very interesting. Okay, now this is how it, um, how they were, uh, now, I was doubtful whether, I was looking at whether these cords connect, because they have not explained where, did they say to the solar plexus, to the trunk area? No, they don't. Uh, but yes, as pranic healers, you might just deduce yeah. it from there. That's but, why I put this uh, let's, here. Let's not assume that. It no, I'm not assuming. So, so this is, so it says uh, what the carmine is like a dye. So they put carmine and rub on the side of her legs from the medium. And uh, what they realized was at the end of science, it was, I don't know how this works. So the ectoplasm, when it moved, the, the, the clothes were physically uh, dyed. So the actual, the pathway was traced from where it came. And um, according to them, they, according to all these experiments, they said it was certain that plasma issues from the trunk as well as returns thereby. So that is to just show you that, you know, it, um, it is uh, to and from the middle area or the trunk area, all right? Uh, now, if you read the book, Orange of Modern Pranic Healing and uh, um, Arhatic Yoga, there's something called guided transfer clairvoyancy. All right, now that is to a certain extent uh, mediumship and to a certain extent, uh, I would say ectoplasm, if you want to call it, you know, the, the words are very, very strange. Uh, but you could call it guided transfer clairvoyancy is a nicer, more scientific sounding word where uh, people who are in the body and people who are not in the body, according to one part of the book, if you read the origins book, it says that uh, Chohan Jigmailing would provide gu guided transfer clairvoyancy to Mang Mike. And Manganene, so Chohan Jigmiling is not around, <laughs> right? So he's a Chohan. So how did he provide uh, guided transfer clairvoyancy to a person in the physical body? Uh, very interesting. 
Okay, you can continue. It's study session, so it's for you to think about. Yeah, you could. Um, sorry, I hope, Sonia, your sound is back because it's, it's fine here at our end. Uh, you're the only one, so maybe just check your Wi-Fi. If the audio is still bad, just if you, uh, if you turn on your video, just turn it off. It, it will help you with your audio, the quality of your audio. Yeah. Yes, you can go and sleep in your parents' uh, room to, tonight. <laughs> okay, so moving ahead. Now, we're talking about this cord again. Now, they say that the cord actually consists of threads right uh, very closely um, connected and then through that the psychic energy goes through right so these threads are there prior and then uh, the psychic force of the psychic energy goes through the threads stiffening the whole um, structure till it becomes as as thick as a girdle right the, the one that the women used to wear the uh, so the girdle uh, girdle sorry and then uh, which can then be moved as desired by forces applied uh, within the body of the medium, right? And so based on that, they can try and figure out. Now, they're going to try and talk to us uh, in a little bit as to how this actually happens. So we'll go into that. Certain experiments, sorry, certain experiments seem to indicate that the end of a rod consists of a thick, yes, and more or less elastic uh, film or skin stretched over a thin, somewhat serrated elastic frame. So one is where they're talking about it being uh, similar to what we're talking about strands. And the other one they say uh, indicates that the rod actually consists of this very thin elastic film. Now the, uh, the thin elastic film is quite delicate because if you kind of uh, put too much uh, pressure on it or that, I think the word here is stressed, it might actually tear, right? It might rupture and uh, the entire serrated frame will then be exposed. So moving on, so those are the two types. We're talking about these fine uh, threads, yeah, these little strands and then the uh, very thin elastic frame, yeah? Um, the film that's on that frame. Okay, so then uh, they, we move on to the fact that the, they actually try to use other instruments, right? To try and see scientific, right? So they're trying to use scientific experiments to try and see actually what's happening uh, to the medium, what's happening to the sitters, how is it actually moving, right? So let's go on with his other experiments. So the first thing that he used is, uh, he actually used the electroscope that uh, helps you with the discharge of electricity, right? And so what he did was, uh, he noticed when you had an electroscope, this would actually discharge uh, electricity that went through the medium's body and then down into Mother Earth. So they realized that the rod was actually a conductor of high tension electricity. And so the, the person's body along with the rod uh, becomes the conductor. Now, uh, once the energy is discharged uh, through, the, through the body of the patient, that's the end of that experiment. However, another thing, on the other hand, the rod placed across the terminals of a bell. Yes. Now, in this case, the, uh, the effect showed that that high resist, basically when it, when it came to the bell, right, the bell did not ring. And so they realize it works only with high tension electricity. Uh, it offers high resistance to low tension currents, right? But not to the bell, the bell never rung. Uh, now this is the way in which they're trying to use scientific experiments to try and show that there, there are certain specific things that happen during that experiment time, during the time of the seance, right? Not before, not after. Now, another thing that they talk about is the white light. Now, if there's a lot of white light, they say that white light actually destroys the formation of whatever is being created. So it starts to say white light usually destroys rod formation. And uh, if you look at pictures, so I went into Google and I tried to look for uh, C, uh, sorry, uh, W.J. Uh, Crawford's pictures, right? There are images because he has taken photographs. And so when you look at the photographs, it's quite interesting. So if you just pull out your phones, you just look for that images of CW uh, Crawford's uh, experiments. It's, it's interesting. You can actually see like, it almost looks like someone has twisted a, you know, like a bed sheet, a very thin bed sheet. <laughs> and there's a rod going from, from the uh, medium across. And then there's 
some interesting thing created on the face and things like that. All right, so let me just move ahead. White light usually destroys rod formation. Even rays reflected from surfaces that are already earlier psychically charged, yes, um, they, they ref even rays reflected from a surface on which a psychic force is exerted interfere with the phenomenon. So white light is not good. Places where there's already psychic energies existing, it doesn't help in this process. <clears throat> However, interestingly, uh, darker rooms, right, uh, really helps. Red light is not too strong, and so you can still continue to see what's happening, the psychic structure of the, um, the ectoplasm that's been created can actually be seen, right? And they also say, uh, neither does uh, light emanating from luminous paint which was previously exposed to uh previously exposed to sunlight also doesn't have any effect so the darker the room to an extent from what i can understand and red light does not have too much of a uh, effect on this phenomenon and so probably why uh, most of these seances including the lady who looks at your crystal ball you know it's usually d slightly dark and dingy <clears throat> because the bright lights don't help them see Usually the, the structures are quite invisible, though occasionally glimpses of them may be obtained. The structures have been successfully photographed by flashlight. But great care must be taken not to injure the medium. So when the medium is doing her work, right, to try and bring about whatever messages and connection to, to the inner world, she should not or he should not be disturbed. And specifically, if the process is stressful, right, that time it can actually injure the medium. So the medium, uh, when things like that happen, people around should be respectful of what uh, the medium is going through. Now, if it's a non-stressful situation, right, then the medium doesn't get as affected. But if it's a stressful situation, she or he can get quite affected. Uh, the shock to the medium when the flashlight impinges on the ectoplasm is much greater when the structure is under stress than not stressed, yes? So uh, we don't want to interfere. We don't try to put the light directly there. So uh, I'm sure uh, Mr. Crawford went through many, many experiments till he realized, okay, you can't do it like directly. You can't put it into the space. He had to figure out ways. And this is what he realized after all experiments. A large number of photographs taken confirm in every detail the conclusion arrived at by deduction from the phenomena uh, themselves. Yes, and so if you look at the pictures, it's um, interesting, right? They're all black and white pictures. If you look at it, um, it, it gives you some idea. And I'll end with this. Um, the rigidity of the rod varies with the amount of light to which it is subjected. The hard end being, at, as it were, partially melted when exposed to light. So they mentioned earlier that light, white light specifically, or reflective, um, not reflective light, what is that called? White light and? Rays reflected from the surface of psychic forces. Those are the two that interfere with the ectoplasm or the energy coming out through the rod uh, to further work with the experiment. So exposure to light doesn't help both your visibility and also what is being formed gets affected if there is exposure to light. Yeah. Okay, um, you can continue from here because I'm going to go to the two principles after this. That's why. Okay. Uh, this is just information. So you already covered everything. What is a little uh, confusing for me, honestly, because you see, this is not my area of specialty. It's none of our areas. <laughs> because uh, Verinder is asking how noises are produced by the rod. I have no idea. Oh, yeah, they haven't mentioned that. Uh, I, I don't how do they physicalize reading. it and the mechanism yeah. behind that? I, I don't know. I, I'm not so interested also. I don't know what I'm going to do with tapping. You know? We're not going to be levitating tables anyway. So uh, maybe this was introduced at that time to get people to realize that there are other things other than the physical and just get them interested in that. But what is confusing yeah. for me is that um, how are they, if this is a cord, how are they just taking a cord out and uh, connecting it to electroscope, then putting it on a bell circuit? I mean, these are cords. I mean, like, uh, how you take, uh, is my, uh, I mean, how, 
I, I don't if get it. If you haven't given the, that's what they said. If you want to really understand, you know, experiment, in some books they actually took to a do mold it. out of clay. They took a clay mold and they put the rod in there. Uh, you ask the operator to extend the rod into the clay so we see what it molds out. How do you do that? I want to try. You ever tried that? Why, when exposed to light, they are removed? Um, actually, that I don't know, but we don't know. I mean, see, I've never tried any of these things, so I would just be uh, uh, speculating. Um, and neither have I asked Master Chua about it. And I don't know. Uh, it was never something that was so interesting for me. It's just good information. But um, why the light? It's not only the light, maybe it's energy that uh, makes it, uh, you know, I think light changes the vibration. It's, it's a very, very uh, st unstable materialization. It's not a stable materialization. So any external factor being introduced, like light or something like that, would make destabilize the structure. That would be my assumption. And not only that, since it is connected to the physical medium, the medium feels actual pain. Uh, and that I've read in a couple of books where, you know, uh, the medium has gotten through pain when the flash photography was used or when certain white light was used, um, uh, fluorescent light or something like that was used. Uh, but the medium actually experienced pain. Not only did it go on, the medium actually experienced pain. And they're saying that uh, the structures have been successfully photographed by, by flashlight, but great tear. See, it says, but great care must be taken not to injure the medium. Yeah. So the light actually causes damage or harm to the medium, which shows that, um, you see, <clears throat> I mean, it's just almost like a rental. <laughs> you know, someone is renting your uh, auric space. And since you are connected to it, they're not going to feel anything. Whatever they feel will be physically felt by you because they don't have a physical body. You can go ahead, Sumi. Ah, is that why Mr. India was seen in red light? Oh. <laughs> Mogambo <laughs> Kushua. Uh, yeah, what happened? No, it's just these images that I'm looking You start Googling all these, you get yeah, scared, you, yeah. Yeah, you should They're wearing see lipstick these pictures. and all. What nonsense. Yeah, yeah, they're wearing lipstick in that one you showed me. See, see, see the lip. See? It looks like lipstick, like makeup. Anyway, never been to any of these things. So, yes. So, uh, let me move on. Now we have to talk about the rigidity of the rod and the objects being moved. We'll go ahead. The principle. All right. So, objects being moved by the psychic force, uh, there are two principal methods, right? So, the first one is one or more rods are projected by the medium from the medium sorry uh, projected Same from day. the medium very frequently from the feet and the ankles so remember he was asking where it was from this is the only place where they've mentioned where it's coming from so the energy that the medium is projecting yes uh, the rods uh, very frequently from the feet and ankles of the medium sometimes from the lower part of the trunk as well so they mentioned the lower part of the trunk, but they specifically mentioned feet and ankles and uh, are attached directly to the object to be moved, right? And so uh, they, they then, that particular part, right? The ankle and the legs then become like a cantilever to try and figure out what it is that they want to move. And so based on that, right, just like beams, they would be there to try and take whatever object that, is, that they're supposed to move in between that. So they say that when tables are moved horizontally, these rods then uh, kind of attach themselves to the legs. Now say for example, that particular table has four legs. It attaches itself to the four legs and then it mushrooms up towards the inner, yeah, the base, right? The base of the table and goes all the way there. So then through that, the medium is able to then levitate and move the table upwards and then bring it back down. And so they say that uh, when they are lifted into the air, the rods or rods are often spread out like a mushroom at the ends and attached to the undersurface of the table. The second method is slightly different here. Now here, remember, they're talking about directly from the ankle or low part of the, <clears throat> the person's body. It attaches itself towards the object, wherever the object is. Now the second one, 
uh, the rods are projected from the medium, attach itself to the floor. So it literally gets grounded first. So it attaches itself to the ground first. And from that point of attachment, they then continue towards the object that needs to be moved, right? So it's almost like it gets grounded and then from there, uh, it moves towards whatever object that it needs to move. Say it's a chair this time, it moves towards that object. Thus forming no longer a cantilever, but somewhat like a lever, right? Uh, and so it's like a fulcrum between the weight and the power. So this is more the lever method, and the first one is more like the cantilever method, like a beam that you might do, like a suspending a, a bridge or things like that. So that's the uh, two methods. Now, the second thing that they mention here is that the rod could either be straight or curved. So these are the two things that they mention. Uh, they may also be held suspended in the air, yes, in a rigid condition that's showing that they do not require to be pressing on material bodies in order to become rigid. So the rod by itself, uh, they are held suspending in the air and they become literally, it looks like there's a, there's a rod, iron rod kind of thing. It doesn't look like it's made out of something very flimsy. Uh, it doesn't sag, it's, it's uh, perfectly straight and rigid. That's showing that it, it does not require uh, any material from the body to continue so somehow it's able to do that yeah so in the case of the cantilever method uh, the whole of the mechanical st stress is transferred to the medium or more accurately the greater proportion of the medium and a smaller proportion to all the sitters who are there with him or her uh, remember there are methods where only the, the medium might do it sometimes there are uh, seances where the sitters also can cont contribute so here you have most of the load kind of borne by the medium and the sitters take a smaller quantity. This can be ascertained by uh, what they actually did is uh, they had like weighing scales. So I presume they had weighing scales for all of them who were seated there along with the table and other things and spring balances. If the table is levitated, for example, using the first method, the cantilever method, uh, the weight of the medium so the physical weight of the medium uh, increases by 95 percent of the weight of the table, yes, and that of the other sitters proportionately. So there is an increase in the weight during the process, but interestingly, after the process, there's a different uh, change. There's actually loss of weight. When on the other hand, the rod are attached to the flow, the weight of a levitated table is transmitted towards the table. So then the, the, force, um, the force is not borne by the medium here, it's borne by the floor uh, and, uh, and, the med and the medium, I think it's, 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 it's much safer. Uh, so let me continue. The weight of the table is transmitted directly to the floor and the medium's weight partially. Uh, instead of being increased here, yes, uh, it is decreased. The decrease being due to the weight of the ectoplasm forming the rod, one end of which rests on the floor, right? So it goes from the medium, goes down to the earth or the floor, and then into the object, the chair or the table that they want to move. When the, when the, the force is transmitted along a, a cord in order to hold an object, such as a table, uh, firmly to the floor, the weight of the medium has been observed to have reduced by 35 Point 0.5, I presume, pounds. On, on other occasions, when the ectoplasm structure was not stressed, the weight of the medium has been reduced by 54.5 pounds, uh, nearly half the normal weight of the medium. Right? So one of the things that happens is, yes, in, initially it looks like the weight of the medium is increasing. Uh, but after the entire process, right, uh, the medium, it is observed that it actually reduces. The weight actually reduces. The physical weight, uh, the normal weight of the person actually reduces. Yeah? You want me to continue with the cantilever and the left? Yeah, I don't have much to say. It's just information, which is interesting. Uh, yeah. But we cannot verify it at the moment. But uh, what they're talking about is um, it comes from the legs of the person. That is why I showed you uh, it actually comes, you know, they're looking from the legs, so it comes out of the legs, but it actually starts somewhere else. 
that's why we showed you uh, the the slide where they did the experiment to show how the energy is or how the ectoplasm is moving around the body so there's like a dye <laughs> a trail that comes from the trunk area down to the actually it goes down to the basic from the basic it goes down to the hips and then through the knees and through the ankles and uh, the soles that so, comes out yeah so, so this one this the cantilever mm -hmm. method is usually used for light objects and the second method we spoke about, which is going towards the floor, right? Anchoring it there. And then uh, that is to lift heavier objects. Yeah. Anything else? Next time you give an intro talk, just cantilever all the participants and they'll all sign up for the class. <laughs> I don't know how many volunteers you'll need if you have 100 people seated in that room. And uh, for example, they're very mental. That's going to be very interesting. Okay. So... Uh, so the cantilever is what I was talking about, right? Uh, during the uh, levitation of objects, the stress of the medium is op often apparent uh, when they, they start to actually look stiff, right? Because literally they're trying to uh, see to it that everything uh, stays physically there. So it's almost their focus makes their bodies also quite stiff. So the stiffness, uh, it's almost like iron-like rigidity in their muscles. Right, the, principally in their arms, but also the whole muscular system. That for us is also the basic chakra for us who are pranic healers. However, luckily for, even though it does stiffen and become iron-like at this point, after the experiment is over, the body will start to normalize. But during the process, it looks very, very stiff. Now, stiffening the musculoskeletal system on a regular basis to help others uh, could actually cause uh, or could be detrimental to the musculoskeletal system of these mediums. Yeah, overall. Yeah, they did have right. Uh, Doctor Sagar is with bones, so maybe <laughs> he can tell us if you keep making the bones and the muscles stiff, it could cause uh, other other complications. No, it's not made for this type of strain. The body yeah, is not made not. for this. So even though it's a short period of time, even if it's just half an hour or an hour, it's I don't think it's a good thing to do it for too long, right? But luckily, it does uh, disappear. Uh, but when you put it through that regularly, I think there would be a long-lasting effect. The production of these phenomen, uh, phenomena appear to result in a permanent loss of weight, both for the medium and the sitter. So what I was talking about, so I think if they keep doing it over and over again, uh, you'll notice that they start to lose weight and probably start having health issues. Yes. Uh, remember, we've got to also understand, especially as pranic healers, that through this rod comes contamination. So remember, we even spoke about the medium earlier where we said the energy that the medium sends, the energy that the sitter sends, when the energy comes back, it's not necessarily the sitter's energy that comes to the sitter and the medium's energy comes to the medium. Some of the sitter's energy will come to the medium. Some of the medium's energy will go to someone else. And so based on the quality of energy of, uh, of the people seated around, you could probably get contaminated even with just that process. Forget even the table. When they say loss of weight, I'm just giving commentary because I really don't have much to add in this. It's just information. Uh, when they're saying loss of weight, um, I don't know if it's fat because if it's fat, then you it's know. It's just a few ounces. A few ounces? Yeah. Or? Yeah, but only to the extent of a few ounces. The, the loss that we're talking about is just but a few if, ounces. You know, if you keep doing it over and over again, it's a lot. You know, uh, if it's actually the bone density that's reducing or those kind of things, because one of the doctors who did research on this, uh, noticed a lot of tissue was uh, different. Some things, I, I don't remember actually, but there was, there was significant physiological changes as well. Then it's really dangerous. So uh, after a point, your body will become very weak and... Correct. Interestingly, uh, it's the fragile. sitter that loses more weight than the medium. Because you have I to understand thought, there's a lot of etheric energy. The uh, there are a lot of etheric energy in your bones and we can't talk about that. Um, so in order to physicalize, maybe that is being utilized and that is very dangerous. Um, yeah, that's why if you've done pranic healing, one of the ways of strengthening the body and increasing the immunity uh, is through visualize the pranic energy going to bones, not only to stimulate the bone marrow, but there are other reasons also. <laughs> okay. Just to make the body strong. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, now coming back to the rod again. Now this <laughs> rod, yeah, the rod, the cord, the okay, cord. the cord, the psychic cord that we have. As a rule, you do not place any kind of uh, material or object between the medium and whatever it is that the medium is trying to move or 
work with because if that rod gets disconnected, then the whole process gets disrupted. So you don't, they say try and put the pencil if you want, maybe a very small pencil uh, vertically along with the way in which the rod is moving. But overall, it, it is better not to disturb this whole process, especially the rod, because that is a connection. It's like electricity, you go and cut the wire somewhere, then the electricity is not going to come up to the bulb, right? So we have to understand uh, that the rod is very important for the process to continue. The source of energy for the whole process comes from uh, the medium or the sitter through the rod. Now, if you see many movies, uh, you notice this, that, you know, if we, they're going and they're trying and communicating and if you disrupt them, their body will get really damaged and sick or something like that. Uh, I think you've seen even that movie, what's the movie? The Last Witch Hunter or something like that. Uh, so she's a psychic. And so I think uh, here it shows that these are not ordinary cords. These are not etheric cords only that we are using for healing because etheric cords I mean, we can heal and people can walk through them. There's no issue with that, all right? However, because we're using the earth uh, as a communication device, but here these are actually more physicalized, more materialized cords. So that's why if you walk through them, you will disrupt the flow of energy and the, and the materialization process that is happening. And because it is using the physicalized energy and physicalized matter of the medium and a little bit of the participants to do that, the medium will feel the impact when you, know, when, when you walk through it or when you disturb it. So it shows that this cord is just, at least from my point of view, based on what they say, this is not just an ordinary cord. What we're doing is usually almost etheric, emotional, you know, high, you know higher etheric uh, cord, but this is more physicalized cord more physicalized cord, which is why you can see it sometimes, which is why definitely you can feel it also. So it's almost there, but not yet physicalized, but you can, you can feel it. Yeah, so I, I think before we go ahead, we have just two minutes, let's just answer questions. Amit, have you looked at mm -hmm. all the questions? Yeah, there's nothing, ha ha ha, psychokinesis, is run away, last week. So all the rest up there? So yeah. This is an interesting chapter, no? If you read the book uh, by uh, Charles Ledbetter, it's literally a, it's a light read. I mean, I'm not recommending the book because honestly, there's it's it's just information that is it's stories actually, stories of all the experiences with, uh, you know, how come the ghosts are wearing the same clothes that they did after <laughs> they upgrade their fashion sets. Then there are other stories like this, and you know how this happened. He didn't explain the process. But he's more explaining uh, many, many stories on all these seances and his experience, how he was thrown out of his mother's house because uh, all his mother's furniture started to get damaged. <laughs> <laughs> the table would break, the chairs would break, it would fall. At one time they got uh, removed from the uh, room and there was so much noise, all the furniture was piled one on top of the other. So, and the mother at that time banished them from the house, to the outhouse <laughs> for these type of experiments. And Madame Blavatsky also has written about this. I forgot in which book. Uh, and she has also written some letters where she's exposed many fraudsters uh, doing, uh, you know, <clears throat> because she wanted to make sure they're not connecting what she calls Western spiritism to Eastern spiritualism. <laughs> so, because people, you know, while criticizing this would criticize spirituality and Eastern spiritualism where Madame Blavatsky would try and say, no, that's completely different. And to prove she would materialize objects in the room, apparently using her psychic powers without ectoplasm or any beings itself. So, and one time Charles Lebeter, uh, he, he was noticing whether it could be clairvoyant. So he imagined, uh, so there was a clairvoyant part of it where minimal ectoplasm was used and he was, he, he created a strong mental thought form of two chubby children uh, where, where, you know, with something, something, you know, they were wearing something. I don't know what they were wearing, whatever. Chubby, you know, kids. And uh, sure enough, the clear was like, I see two chubby kids and he, he explained completely, this is materialized here, you know, they're here and all that. Um, but only ethically. Ethically, and then the person she was the other medium who she's saying that this is your dead person, if, uh, maybe it's your grandkids or this. She's like, no, <laughs> my husband doesn't look like a chubby child. <laughs> so, so it was it's funny. It's just stories, you know. Uh, yeah, light reading. 
Correct. So if you look at it, remember we said that the light affects them, so the white light. So I think that's probably why in the old movie, uh, they, they would use that white kind of rays. You remember? In Ghostbusters, they would do that and the whole thing would explode. And, uh, and I think I remember a part in, in the movie where there's lightning, right? So electricity that comes through and then the whole thing also gets uh, disrupted. So Okay. Uh, so the Jwala, the, in the case of visible but non-tangible forms, where is the ectoplasm source from? Assuming no medium is around, there has to be a medium for that to happen. To materialize. To materialize. It. But there the degree of materialization varies. And there are three degrees of materialization that they have uh, revealed to us. So the first degree of materialization is you can feel, but you cannot see. All right. So it's not, it's materialized enough for you to feel it, but not enough for your eyes to see it. All right. The other one, is it's materialized barely like a vapor, you know, like a smoke. Smoke, but uh, it's and even if you touch it, it'll disrupt it. But it's not tangible. Hema Malini dream sequence, dream girl. It's a shy kid. Thank you, Almighty. I must have no idea what you're talking about. That's all that dream sequence is. It's like mist going all over. I have no idea because I have not seen any of the three. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so. Luckily, Masachua might have protected us from that. So, yeah, with right. that, we are done. Yeah, so with this, we'll end today. We'll get back to ectoplasm on Wednesday. I'll oh. see some of you uh, in the morning oh. meditation. We're going to be doing soul meditation on Wednesday. Oh. Right? So, let's close our eyes. We'll end the session for now. Those of you doing ACPH, we'll see you in the morning. Close your eyes, connect unto the palate. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chua, Fox, we love Maha Guruji Mele. To all the great ones, to all the holy masters, holy gurus, healing ministers, healing angels, to our soul and divine self, <clears throat> to all the angels and beings of communication, of our respective Wi-Fi's, our internet connections, also to the great beings of knowledge, light and power, of theosophy. We thank you for your presence, for your patience, for all the light and knowledge given to us today. We ask you to help us to continue to assimilate it and use it to become better divine instruments with thanks and in full faith. So be it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, Namaste, everybody. Take care. Enjoy your dinner with your family. Bon appetit. And we'll see you Wednesday at 6.30. Yeah? Thanks. Bye. Bye. Boom, boom. Ending for all now.